Hi. I don't know what's going on with this camera, but we're about to find out what is happening. How did that happen? Oh, I know why. Oh. No, that's not right. There we go. Oh, yeah. There we go. Crying out loud. All right. Welcome home, everybody. I pushed all the buttons. <laughs> Welcome home. Are you all ready to finish up this book? Because if you're not, too bad. <laughs> oh, Rondo, that's why I heart you so much. Am I ready? Oh, Kimmy, I'm ready. I like to say I'm a bit of a reader now. I'm in a book club. I'm a bit of a reader. Currently reading this one piece. It's a, it's a translation from a Korean text. Um most beautiful moment in life uh, it's part one we're gonna get a part two next week oh boy i sound so smart when i talk to people and then i trip and fall down the stairs ah uh, well thank you perry hm. all right let's get the fire going for you boop boop yep yep Oh, yeah. Gone and gone. Here we go. All right. Everybody ready? Everybody comfortable? Ready to get rolling? Good. Here we go. Tay. 10 July, year 22. I darted down the sloping roads and through narrow back alleys. I'd lived in this neighborhood for about 20 years. I knew every nook and cranny. Every corner brought back stories and memories, but this wasn't the time for reminiscing. The police were chasing me. I couldn't afford to get lost in memories, but as I turned one corner after another, as I jumped one fence after another, it felt as if time was winding backwards. I spray painted graffiti at the bus stop for the first time in a long time. I picked up the spray cans again because of one girl. I ran into her while she was trying to steal food from a convenience store a few days ago. She couldn't bring herself to look down at her empty hands. She was obviously scared of her empty hands. I didn't want to admit that I knew exactly how she felt. You have to look squarely into your own empty hands. No one can do it for you. But I couldn't turn my head away from her. I recognized the look on her face. The look you feel like you don't belong anywhere in the world. When you're afraid you are responsible for everything that went wrong in your life. When you are lonely and you don't know where to go or where to stay. I saw that girl from time to time after that day. We didn't do anything special together. We just sat on the street or walked along the railroad. And then we did some graffiti together. 
She seemed to feel awkward holding a spray can for the first time, but did her best to follow what I did. And finally, I came to the bus stop. Junie got off at this stop. The police also frequently showed up here. I once caught I once got caught spraying graffiti here. The girl tried to read my face as I stood still with a spray can in my hand. I hadn't been in touch with Junie since I saw him at the hospital, but I did pass by his container by the railroad one night several days ago. I was out in the street to get away from Dad and his drunken temper. I just blindly ran out, wandered around aimlessly, and saw the light on at the container. Somebody was in there. It must have been Junie. I wanted to go in, but I couldn't. I got closer and could hear a faint melody and snoring sound. I sat on the ground in front of the container and looked up at the sky. It was literally pitch black without any hint of stars. The police were gaining on me fast. I was hiding in an alley with a dead end. There was no way out. It was meant to be. Even if I stopped reminiscing and concentrated on getting away, I'd get caught anyway. It was the expected outcome. No problem could be solved with empty fists. I walked out of the alley and put both my arms up, and I surrendered. Junie, 13 July, year 22. I packed my bag and got out of the library. It had been over a month since I started working night shifts at the gas station, and I went to the library during the day. I was beat after coming home from working all night, but I didn't just sit around after the alarm went off. It's not that I'd accomplished anything over the past month. I just stared out the window or skimmed through magazines in a daze. It wasn't like I, was feel I wasn't feeling impatient. I knew I had to go at my own pace, but it wasn't as easy as I, th as I thought. What were all these people doing here in the library? Would I be able to catch up with them? But I didn't know where to start or what to hold on to. I leaned my head against the window of the bus, from the library to the gas station, every day. The tediously familiar landscape slid by outside the window. Would I ever be able to escape from this routine? It seemed impossible for me to even wish for a better tomorrow. A woman sitting in the front of the bus came into view. Her shoulders heaved as if she were sighing. She was the woman who handed out flyers on a pedestrian overpass. I also recognized her from the library. We'd studied at the same library and gone home on the same bus for the past month. I'd never struck up a conversation with her, but we watched the same landscape, went through the same experiences, and sighed in the same way. I saw how she dozed off in one corner of the library and how her nose bled in front of the coffee machine vending machine. I wasn't looking for her, but she caught my eye from time to time. I still had the hairband in my pocket, which I bought from a street vendor without thinking after I saw her hair tied with a yellow rubber band. The bus was approaching her stop. Someone pushed the stop button and several passengers stood up, but the woman did not. She must have fallen asleep. Should I wake her up? I hesitated for a moment. The bus finally came to a stop, but she showed no sign of moving. Passengers got off, the door slid closed, and the bus drove on. The bus reached my stop, and the woman still hadn't woken up. I hesitated once again as I got out through the back door. No one would pay any attention to her. She'd missed her stop already and wouldn't wake up until a few more stops passed. That'd probably add even more fatigue to her life. The bus departed as soon as I got off. I didn't look back. I'd placed the hairband on the woman's bag, and that was it. Several days ago, I'd been here and seen some graffiti painted on the wall in front of the bus stop. I'd automatically looked around, but Tay had been nowhere in sight. I'd assumed he'd left in a hurry because the spray cans were rolling around on the ground. I stared at the graffiti painted all over the wall for a while. Jin, 14 July, year 22. 
I sat on a bench at a tent bar next to Juni. It was after midnight, but the tent bar was filled with guests who had come to close their days with bitter drinks. The call came in the afternoon. Juni had asked me to meet him after his shift at the gas station. And he hadn't said anything so far. He just continued to drain glass after glass. I asked him if anything was wrong, and he just smiled and shook his head. It's just that my life hasn't changed a bit since I was born. It doesn't get better, doesn't get worse. Junie said that his energy had run dry, that he pretended to be a friend when he couldn't do anything for us, that that was why he couldn't meet Tay or visit Jungkook again, that he was making excuses even at this moment, and he was nothing. Our high school years came to mind after we'd had quite a few drinks. That incident Tay disclosed on the beach. Why did Junie defend me then? Why did you do it then? Instead of answering my question, Junie asked another. Why did I do what I did then? Mom's death, my childhood at my maternal grandmother's in LA. Dad's cold expression when I came back to Korea. I'd never felt the warmth of a family. Maybe I was feeling tipsy or it was the night air, but I confided all my secrets that I'd never revealed before. Now I know everything about you, but aren't the others also waiting for you to share your story? Waiting for you to give them a clue about what happened then? Junie said after listening to my confession. I told him goodbye and headed home. I strolled along the street for some time, staggering a bit. The night breeze was refreshing and the moon in the sky was bright. I stopped in front of some graffiti painted on the bus stop. If I confessed everything, would Junie believe me? If someone confessed to me what I was going to say, would I be able to believe that person? A few days ago, I drove past the convenience store where Tay was working. Through the car window, I could see him smiling. He was talking to a customer and laughing out loud. That familiar laughter that made his mouth turn into a square shape. What is there to talk and laugh so loudly about with a customer? Well, Tay had always been like that. He shook with laughter at jokes no one found funny and shed tears at things that no one found sad. How should I reconcile with Tay? The future appeared bleak. How's everything going so far? Is the sound okay? Does it look okay? Is the fire all right? Everything's good? Okay. Just want to make sure. Because, you know, I get locked into reading, and if you're trying to get my attention, I have no way of knowing that at all. Okay, everything's good? All right. Moving right along. Hobie, 16 July, year 22. I turned the pages of the sketchbook one by one. We were smiling together in the classroom turned storage room in the tunnel and against the backdrop of the sea. Of the sea. Jungkook was lying alone on an asphalt road. Blood was streaming down the road. The large moon hung high in the night sky. Are you hurt? I looked back and saw Jungkook coming into his patient room. I had danced with my ankle wrapped in a pressure bandage, and now a plaster cast was around that ankle. I seem to be in better, better shape than you. I deliberately showed a dramatic reaction to his words and said that his health was unbeatable. Jungkook said he'd undergo a thorough checkup the next week and be able to go home after that if there were no problems. I decided that we should throw him a party. We'd had a party at Junie's container on the day Jim had escaped from the hospital with hamburgers and cola and cake that Jin brought. We fought over who got to wear the only party hat until it was crushed. We smeared that expensive cake all over each other's faces. Junie complained 
that he'd have to clean up the mess all by himself, but it was fun. The seven of us finally got together for the first time after we left high school. We laughed at every word and every moment. Every minute together was exhilarating and exciting, even though we didn't say or do really that much. I had wanted to make a day like this, a day we met and laughed together. Hey, that night, Jungkook started to say as we got off the elevator and headed for the front door of the hospital. His gaze was fixed on something outside. He didn't seem to actually be looking at anything. He was just blinking his eyes as if trying to dig up an old memory. Does Jin talk about that night? I mean, has he said that he saw me or... Jungkook stopped talking. Jin? Saw you? Where? I asked, but he didn't open his mouth again. You're a good person, right? Jungkook asked me before we parted. Stop talking nonsense. I tapped him on his shoulder playfully and waved goodbye. I quickly bent my steps. Am I a good person? Growing up, I've been told that I was bright and cheerful. I used to be told that I was sensitive and impressionable. Did that mean I was a good person? I'd never given it a thought before. I looked back and saw him standing at the entrance and looking up at the cloudy sky. Jin, 24 July, year 22. I followed Dad into the brightly lit conference room. I sat on a chair by the entrance and looked around. I wasn't sure why I'd been summoned there. Dad sat in the center and was surrounded by familiar faces. I looked at the clock. The discharge party for Jungkook must have started by now. I was thinking of calling the others when Dad opened his mouth and the entire room became still. The atmosphere was heavy, but it didn't feel ominous. Rather, the room was buzzing with excitement and expectations. The lights went out and the title of the conference appeared on the screen. Master Plan for the Redevelopment of Downtown Songju. Dad had called me all of a sudden. To be exact, it was his secretary who called me. I'd said I had an appointment, but I didn't think it would work. Dad asked me in the car on a way here if I was still hanging out with those so-called friends of mine. I didn't answer. He wasn't asking a question. He was just belittling them, reproaching me for getting along with them, and ordering me to cut ties with them. He didn't even look at me. Don't waste your time on nothing. I'm telling you this out of experience. Besides, you'll have to help out a lot here. Try to learn as much as you can, and then you'll soon grow into an adult worth your salt. Jimin, 24 July, year 22. The inside of the container was completely decorated. The hamburgers, fries, and drinks Hobie brought were set on the table, and Christmassy ornaments were dangling on the walls. Jungkook was sitting in the center. Only three of the seven cups were filled. Hobie had left for his part-time shift after laying out the food and Juni was coming late after his part-time shift was over. No one could get a hold of Yoongi, and Jin said he'd come but hadn't shown up yet. And Tae sat speechless. Is he still uncomfortable in Juni's container? I'd almost dragged him here, but it was impossible to liven up the mood. This was how we were most of the time after returning from the sea. No one reached out to the others first, and no one was aware of how the others were doing. Maybe it was inevitable. We were no longer those students who ditched school to hang out together. We all had our own set of problems and obligations now. We couldn't afford to disregard them just because we wanted to be together. As for me, I had to work hard to stay out of the hospital and decide whether I'd go back to school. I had to prove to my parents as well as myself, that I was okay. I had to make sure that I wasn't a burden 
for anyone. After some time, Jungkook hesitantly stood up. I held on to him, saying he should stay a little bit longer and see Junie. And Jungkook just laughed, saying he'd take a rain check. I couldn't keep him there. We cleared the table and left the container. We turned on our phone's flashlight, and it was 10.30. We parted in front of the container. As I crossed the railroad and waited for the bus to come, I could see Jungkook and Tay walking away in the distance with their flashlights on. Tay, 24 July, year 22. I darted up the stairs, taking three and four at a time. Liquor bottles were rolling around here and there, and cups and plates were scattered across the floor. Dad had fallen to the ground in one corner with his head bowed. My sister said it was not what I thought even before I opened my mouth. Dad's voice was a bit loud and someone must have called the police thinking he was beating us. And then the police officers came into view. Women from the neighborhood who were gathered in front of our door clicked their tongues and walked away. My sister kept apologizing and bowing to the police officers. Nothing was broken and no one got hurt. I didn't need to be ashamed of this situation. Dad's drinking habit had long been the gossip of the neighborhood, but I looked the other way. Dad seemed to have fallen asleep. His face was sunburned and covered with a bushy beard as he was working as a day laborer at a construction site. He had more gray hair than ever before. I could see the watery inside of his mouth and his tongue. I used to kill Dad in my dreams. Once, I almost stabbed him in reality. Maybe it started from that point. I began to sympathize with him. I hated myself for sympathizing with him. Could that person be called a parent? He was not qualified to be one. And someone tapped me on my shoulder. I looked back to find, to find a familiar face. He was a police officer who'd been dispatched to my house a few times. I'd also seen him at the police station several times when I was called in for graffiti. I just bent my head low. It was a gesture to say, I'm sorry for making them rush here for nothing. But I was also uncertain what look to wear on my face. Your neighbors must be worried about you two a lot. The lady who reported this incident didn't sound annoyed at all and asked us repeatedly to come quickly before someone got hurt. Make sure to find her and thank her later. I asked him if that lady's voice was low and husky. He couldn't recall exactly, but it could have been. My sister, who was talking with another police officer, turned her head to look at me. Do you keep in touch with mom? I asked her after everybody left. She was cleaning up the bottles and plates scattered on the floor, and I was sitting against a wall. Dad was still asleep in that uncomfortable position. The sun had already set, and the long window above Dad's head was pitch dark. My sister picked herself up and sat at the dining table. She didn't say a word, but her silence more than answered my question. I asked her for Mom's address and telephone number. I don't know her number. I just know that she lives in a rented apartment in Bukju, Monhyon. Tay, why do you want to contact her? She asked. To ask her what she'd been thinking, like why she left, why she appeared again. My sister sat down next to me. Tay, Mom misses you. I snorted and stood up. She was clearly unaware of how mad I was. I told her I was going to ask mom these questions, but I wasn't particularly curious about her answers. How would it help me, even if I knew why she left? I just wanted to release my smoldering resentment. Why did she come here? She's the one who abandoned us, and now she wants to play the mom figure? I started walking north, towards the direction of Manion. I wanted to walk faster than my throbbing heart. That was the only way for me to be able to breathe. It was already past midnight. Buses had stopped running and I had no money for a taxi. Walking was my only option. 
In order to get there, I had to cross the railroad and a bridge and pass through downtown. I might be able to get there before sunrise. I sensed someone's footsteps behind when I was crossing the railroad. Jungkook was following me. I'd completely forgotten that Jungkook was with me when I ran into the house at the sight of the patrol car out front. Go away! I shouted at Jungkook and walked on without looking back. He must have seen it all. The police, the neighbors clicking their tongues, liquor bottles rolling around, dad snoring, and my sister with her head bent low. Jungkook must have seen all of it. I'd never told anyone about dad's violence. Never. I'd never told the others that mom ran away. It wasn't because of my pride either. Well, maybe it was. It just didn't seem fair that I should have to explain my miserable situation and life by myself. I quickened my pace. I'd finally got out of the residential area and climbed up the stairs of a pedestrian overpass over the railroad when I heard footsteps behind me. I took a quick glance and saw Jungkook. I was going to scream why he was still following me, but changed my mind. It was none of my business. I stepped onto the bridge after coming down from the railroad. He was still following me from far behind. I stopped in the middle of the bridge and looked down at the river. In the dead of the night, roads and buildings were dimly illuminated by the street lamps, but not the river. The jet black river ran ferociously under my feet with a roaring sound. It felt more threatening because it wasn't discernible in the dark. Jungkook also stopped behind me and looked down at the river. There were only two of us on the bridge. No pedestrians and no cars. Our t-shirts were wet with perspiration and flapped in the wind. Do you know we've been walking for the past hour? I waved at Jungkook and he came closer. We began to walk side by side. Can I ask where we're going? I told him I was going to my mom's. I had something to tell her. And Jungkook nodded. My pace was getting slower. I suddenly wondered if I was really going to my mom's. I didn't exactly know where she was living. I didn't know her number or address. I had no plan after arriving at the apartment complex. My rage had subsided in just one hour and was replaced with hunger and pain. I imagined what our encounter would be like. In fact, I had already imagined it countless times. It was the next step that was unclear. After asking mom my questions, what would she say? Would she answer them all? If so, or if not, how should I react? Maybe it was better for all of us if I didn't meet her. That was always my conclusion. But I kept imagining the moment and was now strolling the night street like this without any plan to see mom. Is your leg okay? Come to think of it, Jungkook just got his cast off and I'd made him walk for hours. The doctor said I should walk a lot as rehabilitation. Jungkook showed me a smile and outpaced me as if he was trying to prove it. I couldn't bring myself to say that we should stop here. I decided to trudge on. Aren't you hungry? As I loosened up, all my senses came clamoring back. I'm regretting that I didn't finish off that cake and that hamburger. I giggled at Jungkook's words. Human beings are so absurdly strong or so absurdly weak. And we were the proof, feeling starved, complaining that our legs hurt and laughing together, even in this situation. The lights grew brighter and more, bo more boisterous, and a busy street soon appeared in front of us. It was far into the night, but the brightly lit street was crowded with people and cars passing by. It was 3.30 in the morning. We sat at an outdoor table outside of a convenience store. Jungkook said he was thirsty as we were about halfway through our instant cup noodles. I went into the store to buy drinks, and when I came back, someone was standing in front of Jungkook. He had his back turned to me, so I couldn't tell who he was or what he was doing. Jungkook was looking up at him with an alarmed face. I ran to Jungkook's side and looked up at the man. 
The man was wearing a dark khaki overcoat in the middle of summer. He had a dirty mop of bushy gray hair and his scraggly beard was stained with ramen broth. He reeked of alcohol. He was greedily devouring my instant noodles. It'd be no use asking him who he was or why he was eating my noodles. I was surprised, but not angry. Actually, I was scared. At that moment, someone from a group of troublemakers coming out of the convenience store shoved the man's shoulder, and another tripped him. The man in the overcoat lost his balance and pushed the table as he fell down. Jungkook's instant noodle cup toppled over, and the broth spilled all over his legs. Jungkook sprang to his feet and hastily shook it off his pants. He said he was okay and wasn't burned as the broth had cooled already. The group of troublemakers were walking away, snickering. The man in the dirty khaki overcoat was staring at the toppled cup. His fingers were on the table and covered with noodles. I couldn't bring myself to ask if he was okay. Shouldn't you apologize? You just made this mess, I screamed at the men. They looked back. No, we didn't. He did. And no one told you to sit there. Little punks out at this hour, the men cursed inarticulately. The man in the dirty overcoat looked at me. Our eyes met in the air. He had yellowish eyes and a face covered with age spots. He reminded me of someone. Someone who was always on the drink, swinging at everything with his fists and living like a dictator and a loser. What I expected to happen, happened. I flung myself at the men and two from the group threw punches at me. I dodged the first punch, but the second punch grazed my chin. Jungkook stepped in to stop me, but caught up in the, fist f uh, in the fight as well. The plastic tables and chairs were turned over, and the no-parking sign got kicked down. The part-timer of the convenience store had already called the police, as if he were, as if he were used to such rows. We could hear the siren a minute later. We all leapt to our feet and ran in opposite directions, shouting at each other. They were lucky to get away this time. I was particularly good at fleeing. I sometimes got caught on purpose, but now was not one of those times. I continued to lead the way, checking whether Jungkook was keeping up. A silvery car passed by us at full speed. Its side mirror brushed against JK. Stunned, he sank down. He'd just been discharged from the hospital after two months because of a traffic accident. It was natural that he was stunned. The car came to a screeching stop, and one of the men who'd hit us earlier stuck his head out of the passenger seat window. Watch it. We're letting you go just this once. There'll be no mercy next time. And the car vanished with a roaring engine. Jungkook slowly picked himself up, holding onto my arm. He looked uncomfortable. He must have hurt his leg when he fell. The inside of my mouth throbbed. Blood smeared on the back of my hand when I wiped my mouth with it. Where should we go? JK asked. With this leg? We're, we're, go we're going back. Jungkook began to walk, saying that he was okay. Look, I'm fine. I stood there and watched Jungkook drag one leg from behind. Let's go back, I shouted at JK. I checked my phone. It was 4.50 in the morning. We still had some time to kill until the first bus came. I looked around and found a low hill behind the entertainment district. Have you seen the sunrise? I propped up Jungkook as we walked up the hill. I sank down on the stairs at the end of the gentle slope. They say the sky is at its darkest right before the sunrise, and it was true. No stars were visible in the pitch-dark sky, but neon signs of different shapes and colors were radiating bright lights in the city down below. I turned my eyes northward. I roughly guessed the neighborhood that Mom must be living in. There, that must be it. She must be eating, sleeping, and cleaning in that apartment. Jungkook, I followed Mom then. Jungkook stared at me. I fixed my eyes on the lights streaming out of the windows of the apartment complex. Then, that night, that night ten years ago when mom left home, that night when my mom, my sister, 
and I were beaten to a pulp by Dad, and we cried ourselves to sleep. I couldn't recall why he beat us so hard, but I distinctly remember thinking, I'm supposed to go swimming with my friends tomorrow, and I guess Mom won't be able to pack a lunch for me. Will my busted lip heal by tomorrow? If not, they're going to make fun of me. My shoulders hurt. I shouldn't have tried to turn to avoid his punches. My sister is weeping quietly. It was even more distressing to hear it today. Half asleep, I caught a glimpse of Mom standing at our feet and looking down at us. She was leaving. She was deserting us. I knew it immediately. I pretended to be asleep, got up, and followed her. I didn't have a plan. I wasn't thinking of living with her. I didn't feel bitter or scared. What, what would it be like to have no mother? What would it be like to live without one? It wasn't something you could just understand. I followed her for quite some time. In my memory, I walked all night, but my memory must be exaggerated as a little child then. She didn't look back, not even once. Was she really unaware of me following her? Maybe she was struggling to look forward for fear of having to take me with her if she looked back. Of course, that thought came to me afterwards, when I struggled to grasp an understanding of her. Now, I don't know why I came this far. Hey, I looked up at Jungkook's voice. I'm sorry. I gazed at him. What are you sorry for? Why are you sorry? You couldn't go see your mom because of me, Jungkook answered. Are you an idiot? I flared. I didn't mean to lose my temper, but my voice got louder on its own. My tongue continued to trip as I wasn't good at speaking and didn't know how to express my feelings. Why do you feel sorry? People should be sorry for you. What did you do wrong? I should be sorry for bringing you here. My parents, who made me bring you here, should be sorry. Those guys who picked the fight first should be sorry. I continued to raise my voice. You're a good person. You are as good as you can be. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. The sky, which had seemed to remain pitch dark forever, began to turn bluish in a flash. The light that permeated the sky from the farthest end sucked in the glimmer of the neon signs and we watched the sunrise without a word. The huge, red-hot sun surged up over the apartment complex. Is Mom watching the sunrise, too? The two of us sat in the back of the bus next to each other on our way home. It was before dawn broke over us. The road was empty, and the bus continued to race along. I turned my head and looked towards the north once again. That night. Mom had stopped walking. She stood there motionless for some time. She didn't look back either. If I had continued forward at that point, I would have reached her. I could have held on to her hand and asked where she was going, where she was headed while leaving us behind, and when she was coming back. I could have cried, thrown a tantrum, and maybe even pulled her back home but I just turned around and returned home alone. My entire body ached, and I couldn't go swimming with the others. I lay on the floor, sweating and trying to sleep, and I didn't know why. It's that man again! Hearing Jungkook's voice, I looked out the window. A stooped-over man in a khaki overcoat was walking alone. The Direction Where the Sun Rises Hobie, 25 July, Year 22 I ran into Yungi on my way to the practice room from the hospital. I was heading to the practice room without realizing it and stopped. What would I even be able to do there? My ankle had gotten worse. The soft cast had been replaced with a real plaster cast. The doctor scolded me. You shouldn't strain your ankle. But I couldn't sit down while working at the burger joint. I had a lot going on at the practice room, too. 
you have to be extra careful with your ankle. It's been injured before and it might get damaged permanently unless you take extra care. The doctor kept saying this again and again. I entered onto the main road leading to my house on crutches. I hadn't gone home at such an early hour before. I hadn't skipped training without a special reason. And I came face to face with Yungi. He was drunk and staggering at a crosswalk. He didn't recognize me as he brushed past. I turned my head and fixed my eyes on the walk signal. Two days after my visit to Jungkook at the hospital, I'd gone to Yungi's workroom. He didn't answer my call, so I just went straight in there. It must have been in the morning because it was before I went to Two Star Burger. I knocked on the door. No one responded. The faint sound of music streamed through the door. I thought of calling him again, but gave up, and I kicked the door instead. I'd known Yoongi since middle school. I knew how his mom had died, how her death had impacted him, and how he'd struggled afterwards. I tried to be a comforting, reliable friend to him. I laughed off his harsh words and took him around even though he thought I was annoying. But we were of no importance to him. We thought at least Jungkook must be different. He surely knew what he meant to Jungkook. He'd already heard about Jungkook's accident from Jimin, but he didn't come to the hospital. What's worse, a woman who claimed to be his musical partner came up to me out of the blue several days ago. She told me that she'd found me after asking around with everyone. She said that she wasn't able to contact him. The walk signal turned green. I began to cross the crosswalk, staggering myself. I looked back as I bent my steps. I tried not to, but I couldn't help it. Yungi lay on the street in front of a cart selling accessories. The vendor screamed at him as passers-by frowned. When are you going to stop doing this? He looked up at me blankly. Do you think you're the only one going through some tough times? Do you think I put a smile in front of others because my life is all rosy and bright? Tell me. What are you so upset about? Everybody knows you're good at music and they all willingly put up with you even when you act up. Yeah, you must have been in pain since your mom died. I know. But you can't go on like this forever. Aren't you going to make music? Can you live without it? Haven't you been happy even just once because of music? Why didn't you go see Jungkook? Don't you know what you mean to him? Don't you see that we're all hurting too? Don't you see that? I didn't mean to push him so hard, but I was really upset. It wasn't entirely because of him. I was upset that I was on crutches. Injuries were inevitable, but also fatal for dancers. I thought I'd been on guard, but I got hurt at an unexpected moment, and it was my fault. No one else could be blamed for it. I knew I'd be nervous and conscious of my ankle every time I dance, and that it'd make me dispirited. Or else, I'd get injured again. And yet, I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't live without dancing. I had to keep dancing despite being dispirited and injured. It's time to stop running away. If you're going to run away again, don't ever come back. I turned around and crossed the street. Hobie! I thought I heard him calling me, but I didn't look back. I'd always blamed myself for everything that went wrong. I'd always thought I should have done this or endured that. I didn't want to live like that any longer. Yungi, 25 July, year 22. I opened my eyes in the middle of the night. It was raining. Curses came out of my mouth automatically as I picked up myself from the ground. I sat still for a while. My entire body was soaked wet with rain. I felt shaky and chilly all over. If you're going to run away again, don't ever come back. Hobie's voice rang in my ears. All I could remember after leaving Jungkook's hospital was that I continued to falter bump into things, and fall. Seized by drunkenness, headaches, fear, and despair, I was unaware of how much time had passed 
or where I was. That's when I came across Hobie. At that moment, I felt choked up. It was half joy and half relief. For some reason, I believed that he'd be able to understand my confusion and fear, even though I didn't understand it myself. But Hobie looked away. He was pretending to not have seen me. Soon the signal changed and I just stood there watching him walk away. And then someone shoved me and I fell to the ground. I heard people screaming and clicking their tongues at me. Why didn't you go see Jungkook? Don't you know what you mean to him? Of course I knew. Maybe that was why I couldn't go into his room. I was distorted and thorny. Anyone who tried to come near me was bound to get hurt. I raised my head and looked onto the desolate mountain trail. There were two directions. I could walk deeper into the mountain, or I could turn around and go back down. I began to move towards the dark forest. I always took my chances at forks in the road. I had no destination. I'd lost my sense of time. Maybe I was going around in circles. It felt as if my knees would give in any minute because of the biting cold and fatigue. I was out of breath and my heart was throbbing. What if I just collapsed here and died? Well, if I'm destined to die here, then this is where I will die. And I sank down. Raindrops fell on my face. It was as dark with my eyes open as when they were closed. I was drowning in layers of darkness. I thought of death again and again. I wanted to flee from the fears and desires that continued to haunt me. I wanted to run as far from that terrifying object that I was helplessly drawn to but couldn't look at straight. That agony that pushed me from one extreme to the other. Now must be the time. And it was all for the better. I'd inflicted pain on others as I suffered greater pain. I looked away from their wounds. I didn't want to take any responsibility. I didn't want to get involved. That was who I was. This moment must be a blessing for everyone. I blinked slowly and began to doze off. The cold, pain, and fatigue disappeared. I became numb to the darkness and the light and my surroundings. Everything became dim. I opened my eyes again at the sound of a piano. It was silent, except for the sounds of raindrops falling and leaves rustling. Amidst the silence, the fragile and delicate piano sounds continued to drift towards me. Someone playing the piano deep in the mountain in the middle of the night? I thought it was a hallucination, but it continued. I smirked. It was that melody. That melody I'd tried so hard to recall. That something substantial that was missing, that made me stay up all night for days on end. Why was it coming to me at this moment of all occasions? I concentrated harder, but the tune was still barely audible and distant and interrupted by the sound of rain. I started coughing. I tried to stand up, but stopped. What would I do now, even if I could discern the melody? What would change, even if I completed my music? I'd never wanted to be recognized by others, receive applause, or be famous. I'd never wanted to prove myself. Then what would it mean to complete this piece? But I pushed myself up from the ground with one hand and started towards the direction where the sound was coming from. I was staggering and my body was trembling. My face and hands were numb, and I couldn't feel my legs. None of my body parts seemed to be under my control, but I took firm steps, one at a time, to get closer to that melody. Heavy drops of rain struck my head. My shirt was dripping wet. Every joint and muscle seemed to scream. My legs shivered so violently that I couldn't lift my feet from the ground. My feet slipped on the wet grass, and thorny twigs brushed against my shoulders. I felt chilled to my core and almost collapsed. My pace grew slower and slower. The piano melody had been subsiding with every step I took. 
I strenuously quickened my pace to find the source of the music before it stopped. I was afraid that if it did, I would never be able to hear it again. I marched forward. Not able to tell the walking trail from the forest, I was struck by drooping branches. Then suddenly my knees crumpled and I fell to the ground. I was so out of breath that I felt like throwing up. All my senses came rushing back and I felt the cold, fatigue, and strange surroundings deep in the mountains so vividly. As I quickened my pace more and more, as I hit against more branches, as my feet slipped harder, the piano sound became clearer. The more severe the pain, the louder the sound grew. I finally stopped walking after wandering in rain for hours. The melody was more vividly brought to life. It exploded in my head as it combined with what I'd been composing up until a few days ago. I covered my head with both arms and sank down. It was closer to a raw emotion than music. It stimulated my sense of pain rather than my hearing. It was a combination of suffering, hope, joy, and fear. It was everything that I tried so hard to get away from. Suddenly a scene from one bright sunny afternoon appeared before my eyes. I was playing a tune in front of the piano in my workroom. It was that melody that continued to revolve in my head. This sounds really nice. Jungkook came closer. I chuckled. You always say that. It was not a single melody. It was a combination of various memories. From the days I used to playfully pound on the piano keys as a child. From the days my friends danced in sync with my performance in the classroom turned storage room. From the days when I stayed up all night writing pieces and inhaled the fresh morning air. My piano was beside me at every moment. These happy memories always ended up being shattered to pieces, but they could not be denied. What would it mean to complete this piece? I still couldn't find the answer. But there was something that preceded this question and the answer. I wanted to capture all this before it scattered into the air. It wasn't to please anyone or to, or to prove something. It wasn't even for myself. I just wanted to capture this emotion pain and fear which were about to explode in my head and heart with music. It didn't have to single the beginning of something. It didn't have to mean anything. I just wanted to complete this music. The piano sound was no longer audible. The rain was gradually subsiding, but my body was trembling uncontrollably. I closed my eyes and felt everything surrounding me even more vividly. The raindrops that fell on my cheeks splashed onto the ground and flowed in a stream. The chilly wind, the smell of soil, the rustling sound of leaves, and my breathing. When I picked myself up, the sign for the mineral spring came into sight. I thought I'd roamed deeply enough into the mountain, but I was back where I'd started, and the path still stretched in two opposite directions. I bent my steps towards the direction where the sun rises. Jimin, 28 July, year 22. I checked the inside of Two Star Burger. Hobie was nowhere to be seen. It had been four days since he last showed up at the practice room. Someone said he told my dance partner that he'd take a break. But after that, he didn't answer anyone's call. He didn't even read the messages posted in the Just Dance group chat. I knew his ankle was bothering him. Maybe it was that night the night when my dance partner was injured because of me. It had rained that night, and he carried her on his back to the hospital in the rain. His condition must be getting worse. As I stepped into the restaurant, the workers greeted me cheerily. Is Hobie off today? They said he was on sick leave, probably for three weeks, but they weren't sure. His ankle got worse. He had to wear a cast, and the manager recommended that he take some time off. I ran directly to his house. I couldn't wait for the bus to come, so I ran up the sloping road. It was scorching hot that day. My back was dripping with sweat. I darted up the stairs to his rooftop room. The doorknob, heated by the sunlight, was burning hot, and it was locked. I left a message in our group chat. 
Where are you, Hobie? By the end of the day, he still had not replied. Yungi, 28 July, year 22. I could finally manage to get up in the afternoon. I suffered from severe chills for two days after coming down from the mountain. I couldn't remember any details from those two days. I trembled and shivered with fever. I sometimes came back to myself, but quickly lost it again. My sheet was soaking wet. I still felt giddy. I stepped out of my workroom trying to keep myself steady. I went to the hospital to get an IV and then stuffed food in my mouth. But I threw it all back up. I read Jimin's message while I was rinsing my mouth out in the restroom. Although the number next to the message went down, there were no replies. I walked along the railroad and arrived at the bus stop. There was an unfinished building in the distance. The construction had been halted for months. The music shop was slightly up the hill after passing by that building. I stopped in front of that shop. And there was no crackling sound of flames or a clumsy, slow piano performance either. I didn't have the energy to bend down, pick up a stone, and throw it. The whole thing seemed like a distant past and made me wonder if it really had happened. I couldn't see a piano through the show window. Don't you see we're all hurting too? Don't you see that? That was what Hobie said the other day. The memories of that day were all tangled up in my head, but I distinctly remembered that Hobie was somewhat different. It wasn't the first time that Hobie had been angry with me. He'd never been on such edge, but he'd always pushed, pulled, and encouraged me every time I fell. Why did it feel different? I opened Jimin's message again. Where are you, Hobie? Several hours had passed, but Hobie hadn't replied. I could see that I'd let him down. It felt as if something inside me was flopping and thumping around. Hobie often got angry and pushed us but he'd never lapsed into silence or looked the other way. He was the one who always paved the way for me to come back no matter how far astray I'd gone. Not this time. It seemed irrevocable this time. Junie, 7 August, year 22. I switched on the light and looked at the flyer that was attached to the door of my container. It read, Redevelopment and Demolition. People must be talking about the redevelopment of this area again. There was always chatter about tearing down the containers lining the railroad and the squatters' buildings across the railroad. I crumpled up the flyer and threw it into the trash can. The talk of the redevelopment didn't, be didn't begin yesterday, but it always boiled up as if demolition would take place the next day and then subsided after a short while. I put down my bag and lay on the floor. It had been a while since the sunset, but the inside of the container was still hot. I spent every night here as I, after I visited JK. It felt exhausting. My nose bled from time to time when I was washing my face. But I always came here instead of the tiny black room, back room of the gas station. No one else had opened that door and stepped in here. Maybe no one ever would. All those who meet must part, without exception. It could have been our turn. But if someone still felt the need for us to be together, I wanted to send him a signal that I was here. I wanted to show him that our hideout was still here and still lit. Hmm. Tay, 11 August, year 22. I came out of the convenience store after finishing my shift. I habitually took out my phone, but there was no missed calls or messages. It was sundown and the street was full of people busily walking by. I put both hands into my pockets and walked on. A sultry wind swept across, across the road. I started to sweat after taking a few steps. How much longer was this summer going to last? I kicked the ground, frustrated. I kept walking with my head bent low and stopped in front of a familiar looking wall. It was the wall where the girl drew her first graffiti. I automatically looked around. 
Since that night when I left her in the alley and came out in front of the headlights of the patrol car by myself, I hadn't seen her in my neighborhood. I discovered a large X sprayed over her graffiti as I tried to find her traces. What did that mean? Various images overlapped the X'd out graffiti. The image of her laughing at me when I tried to lie on the railroad and hit my head. And how she got up and she got me back up to my feet when I helped her flee and fell. How she lost her temper when I took her bread and ate it. How she looked gloomy every time she passed by the photo studio with family pictures on display. I told her as we sprayed this wall side by side. Don't think you have to carry the burden alone. Share it with others. The giant X was sprayed all over those memories. It seemed to scream that they were fake, that they were all lies. I'd never really looked at this wall since that day. I was about to turn around when I discovered a short sentence written in tiny characters under the X. It's not your fault. It was scratched into the wall. It was that girl. I didn't see her write it or recognize her handwriting, but I just knew. It's not your fault. It was that girl. I recalled the day I blindly set off to find mom. I kept marching frantically, filled with seething resentment. But in the end, I couldn't get anywhere that day. While walking back home empty-handed, I turned my head towards the city where she lived. The city was receding under the light of the day, dawning in the east, and I felt like crying. Something that I'd been firmly clinging to seemed to be slipping through my fingers. Lumps of hard feelings noisily fell apart. It felt sad and sorrowful, as if I'd given up something that shouldn't be given up. It's not your fault. The sentence reminded me of how I felt at that time. I started walking again. I passed through narrow alleys and went up and down countless slopes, and finally my house, Magnolia Mansion, came into view. I climbed the stairs. When I stood in front of the door, I could hear Dad's heavy breathing and the clattering of liquor glasses. I turned around, placed my hands on the guardrail, and looked out. The sun had already set. Its dim red tint was disappearing from the darkening sky. It's not your fault, I muttered. I took a deep breath, turned around, and went into my house. Hobie, 12 August, year 22. Someone shoved my shoulder as I got off the train. I dropped the ticket I was holding. It fell onto the railroad and slipped into one of the cracks. I looked around. It was midsummer when I left, and it was still summer now. The train departed for the next station, stirring up wind. At the end of last month, I left Songju by train from this platform. I watched the city receding out of that window. As far as I could remember, I lived in Songju. I'd never left the city and never imagined living anywhere else. I went to the burger joint and to the practice room on schedule. After dancing for hours, I went home and crashed. Although the town was small, in Songju I had somewhere I needed to go to, somewhere I needed to be. After my ankle was injured, my daily routine fell apart. I went to work and the practice room wearing a soft cast. The condition of my ankle worsened. With a full cast on, I had to take a sick leave. I had the whole three weeks full of nothing. Three weeks of no work, no dancing, and nowhere to be. I managed to get by in the morning on the first day. The rain that poured throughout the night stopped at dawn. I cleaned the house and organized my clothes. I got a haircut and wiped rainwater from the bench in front of my house. But I ran out of things to do in the afternoon. My phone didn't ring. Some messages from my co-workers and the members of Just Dance were all that came in. Still, no call or message from the others. Come to think of it, I'd always been the one who contacted the others first. I laid my phone down. I didn't want to contact them first this time. What if none of them sends a message? So be it. 
I remembered how I'd run into Yungi the night before. What I blurted out was replayed in my head. I sprang to my feet and shouted into the air. He won't remember anyways. The way home seemed farther than usual after I left Yungi there. I had to go up the slope on crutches. Although the sun had set, the air felt sultry. It was also humid. I was drenched with sweat when I got home. I didn't regret what I'd said to Yungi. It was time for him to stop indulging in self-pity. But those moments, those words kept coming back to me. On the rooftop, I could look down on the city without me. The train was passing through downtown and disappearing around the corner at the foot of the mountain. I carelessly threw my clothes into a bag and headed for the station. I browsed through the list of cities in front of the ticket office and picked the largest city nearby. I thought it'd be better to move to the large city, and just like that, I left Songju. I got off the train after about two hours. As soon as I walked out of the station, I was faced with a bustling intersection, rows of high-rises and people busily walking under the bright sun came into view. I took the first bus that stopped in front of me. Where should I get off? The driver looked at me like I was speaking nonsense. A passenger who asks his own destination? Yeah, I must have sounded pretty stupid. After about 20 minutes, the bus arrived at a neighborhood that seemed like an old part of town. I put down my bag in a small room attached to a market that had a guest house sign. I stepped outside. I couldn't tell which direction, direction was which. I just roamed around the neighborhood for the first two days. There were no high-rises and no brightly lit commercial district. It was similar to my neighborhood where my rooftop room on the slope was. I'd chosen to leave Songju for the first time in my life and arrived at another Songju. Maybe this was why. I tried not to think of the city and people I'd left behind, but I lost control. I turned on my phone and thought about the others. I might have left Songju, but my mind was still there. On the third day, I decided to venture out further. But in less than 20 minutes after I left the market, my shoulders began to stiffen with the crutches underneath them. Sweat ran down my back under the scorching sun. A red brick building came into view. It was the Citizens Hall. While I was pushing the button on the vending machine, the door of the auditorium opened and several people came out. The sound of music streamed through the open door. I could see a man stretching in one corner of the stage with the spotlights illuminating his head. I was heading into the auditorium before I knew it. As I closed the door behind my back, I was left alone in the darkness and music. I sat down in the closest seat. The sound of music flowed through the air like lapping waves. The man on the stage moved slowly and stretched his legs, ankles, arms, neck, and shoulders. His stretching, which went on for quite a while, seemed like a piece of choreography itself. And then the music stopped. The man who was sitting on the floor picked himself up and walked to the center of the stage. The stage was immersed in silence for a while. The music started again. This time it came down in torrents. The man quickened and slackened his moves to the music. His arms and legs formed not just straight lines and curves, but three-dimensional shapes. One moment led to another through his dynamic moves and gestures. His movements were creating a story that seemed to have no end. He pushed aside the air with his hands and sent reverberations through the ground, which sent adrenaline rushing not to my eyes, but to my mind. The pitch of the music grew lower and lower and led the man to a greater outburst of emotion. He roared with rage with all his might, caught his breath, and gazed at something far away. His suffering, hope, joy, and fear were conveyed unfiltered. Feelings that I'd never experienced before gushed and whirled inside me. I wasn't aware of how much time had passed. The light of the auditorium was switched on, and I just sat there, motionless. Someone approached me and asked me to leave because the dancers were rehearsing. Outsiders weren't allowed to stay. The Dance Academy performance poster was attached to the entrance of the Citizens Hall. 
the man on stage wasn't featured in the poster. The performance was scheduled to take place the day after tomorrow. I came back to the guest house and lay on the wide bench in the backyard. I closed my eyes and thought over those hours at the auditorium. It was my first time to see a real performance in person. It was a whole different experience from what I'd seen through that small window called YouTube. Hmm. I might have been all the more awestruck because it was so vivid and alive. I retraced each motion and gesture that made my heart pound. At that moment, my phone rang in my pocket. Where are you, Hobie? It was Jimin's message. The number next to the message went down gradually, but no other message was posted afterwards. What should I say? I had always explained myself half-jokingly, but I didn't want to do that this time. It was the first time I hadn't responded to a message directed to me. Our group chat fell into silence. I went to the auditorium at the same time the next day. I hid in the darkness and watched the man's moves. It was the same performance, but it conveyed a different story and different emotions. Who was he? How could he express and convey all these feelings like this? The rehearsal ended. As I stepped into the hallway, I met the man's eyes as he was talking to the staff members way ahead. I bowed without realizing it. A staff member came up to me and said, Oh, you're the guy from yesterday. The performance took place the next day, but the man wasn't in it. The performance, which had four chapters, didn't feature him. The show went on for over an hour, and I applauded and shouted out several times from my seat. But that was it. I couldn't relive that overwhelming moment that boiled my heart and froze my body. None of it could compare to his amazing moves. Why didn't he join the performance? I paced around the stage after the performance, but there were only staff members and dancers busily tidying up. I came across the performance team again at the train station. I was stepping onto the platform to leave for another city and saw a group of people gathered in the distance. They were obviously having trouble loading stage sets and all sizes of equipment on the train. I didn't have a set purpose when I went over and helped them. It was just that they looked confused and inexperienced and I was used to arranging and moving things. My cast got in the way, but I was better than most of them who were just standing there flustered. Hey, you're that guy again. I looked around and found that staff member. I didn't even thank you properly. The staff member came to my seat a little while after the train departed. He sank down in the next seat and said about half of the staff had left because things got messed up. He added that they wouldn't have made it without my help. He pointed at my cast and asked if it weren't too much stress on my ankle, and I just waved my hand. By the way, that man I saw in the rehearsal... Why wasn't he in the performance? And he seemed confused at first. Then he nodded. Ah, him. He's our artistic director. The staff member's explanation continued on and on. How he'd once been an acclaimed dancer. How he'd suffered a terrible injury. How he'd undergone years of despair and frustration. Do you know the most amazing part? He surprised everyone and made a comeback as a choreographer and a director. But the injury had left a lasting impact. He couldn't perform on stage again. The staff member gave a deep sigh. It was getting dark outside the window. I came to join and tour with the show by coincidence. I helped them unload their baggage on the next station, and my bag got swept away in the process. Fortunately, I had the number of one of the staff members. I got off at the next station, went back to the station they got off at, and headed to their lodging. It was late at night. I was invited to spend the night with them. I had breakfast with them the next morning and tagged along to the District Cultural Center, which was their next venue. The staff's proposal to join them and tour together must have been partly as a joke. I also half-jokingly chimed in. At that moment, his practice began. I watched him blankly, and then I asked them, Can I really go with you? I toured around three cities with them. 
We took a bus or train, got off, unpacked at a motel, stuffed food in our faces, checked the stage at the performance venue, came back to the motel, and got on the bus or train again. The man stretched and practiced every day, no matter where we were. He never skipped a day, although he wasn't going to perform on stage. I made friends with the staff members and the dancers. Their dances and mine were different, but we shared the passion to express what we feel through movement. We talked about dancing on the train and while we waited for the bus. We told one another about our favorite dancers and watched their videos together. I finally got to speak with him when I was showing the staff a video of Just Dance practicing. You're a dancer? I looked around and he was standing there. I stood up, stooping slightly. I looked at the man. I was at a loss as to how to answer his question. I was hesitant to admit in front of him that I was also a dancer. You're a dancer, he said, pointing at me in the video. That's how I first came to talk with him. Well, why do you like dancing? I nervously slurred the end of my sentence. Well, that is, uh, you know... The man asked me when I first started dancing. I told him it was at a talent show at school when I first was about 12. My classmates had dragged me onto the stage. My body began to move automatically. I got even more excited with the clapping and cheering of the audience. I couldn't think of anything else. I just moved spontaneously. After the music ended, I looked ahead, running my fingers through my hair drenched in sweat. I felt as if I'd thrown up all the lumps that were clogging my heart. It felt refreshing and rewarding. It took me a long time to realize how exhilarating it was and that that feeling didn't come from the audience's applause, but from deep within myself. The man pointed at me in the video and said that he liked my moves. Not every dancer can move like this. I watched myself in the video. I liked how I looked when I danced. I could fly into the air off the ground and break free from the eyes and yardsticks of the world. Nothing was important to me except moving my body to the music and communicating my feelings through my body. Off the stage, I was tied down by so many things. I couldn't stay in the air with my feet off the ground. I had to smile and laugh, even when I was upset and sad. I used to collapse on the street taking medication I didn't need. There were moments when I could reveal who I truly was, moments when I believed I could be happy again, moments when I could let go of everything that weighed me down and soar high, moments I could reach heights unimaginable off stage, and dancing gave me those moments. I heard you overcame a serious injury. The man stared at me. I knew I was being rude, but I had to ask him. The man looked down at my cast and opened his mouth. Height is important, but so is depth. You have to hit your bottom. You have to go down until you can't go lower, until you feel as if you'll suffocate from your despair. Then you have to escape from it. What is crucial is to discover your driving force. In other words, you have to find what makes you stand firm again. Once you find it, don't ever let go. It can be a person or a desire. It can be evil and disgusting, but stick to it. That was our first and last conversation. The tour continued, but I didn't have another chance to talk with him. I watched him practice every day and thought about what he'd said, deeply, my darkest despair. What would make me stand firm again from that despair? Do you live in Songju? The director is also from there. A staff member said this to me when I was looking at a promotional leaflet in the lounge at the train station. The fireworks festival on the shores of... Yangcheon in Songju, August 30th. As far back as I could remember, I'd seen the festival every year. It was held at the end of every summer. When I was living in the orphanage, we all climbed up to the rooftop and watched the fireworks surging into the night sky and showering back down. 
After I left the orphanage, I lived in the topmost floor of a multi-household house in the highest neighborhood in Songju. It was the perfect spot for watching the fireworks. Although it was a bit far from the fireworks display, it provided a wide, uninterrupted view. Did you change your mind overnight? The staff member asked me. He was the one who had suggested that I join the staff several days ago. We thought you were reliable and talented. The other staff members agreed enthusiastically. Some of them even applauded. I almost said yes. I had become attached to them without realizing it. Touring was an arduous job, but I enjoyed every moment of it, even lying down on the bed at night, moaning and groaning. My ankle would heal gradually as I continued to work with them and stage more performances. Maybe I'd be able to audition and be selected as an official member and get to perform on stage. Maybe I'd be able to receive training from the man and learn more about depth. I'd begun to think, this might be where I belong. The staff member told me to sleep on it, and I gave him my answer last night. I thanked him for his suggestion and told him I had to go back. Are you sure? He asked me once again. Picking up my bag, I replied, I have to go get my cast off. I got on the train at the opposite track. I had arrived at Songju Station in two hours. It felt thrilling. I hadn't been pushed to hit my psychological bottom yet. It may never happen. But I'd thought about some moments after the conversation with the man. I won't contact you ever again. You live your own life. Don't ever come back. Maybe Yungi had hit his bottom that day. Hobie. I'd turned around and walked on, and he'd called to me, and I didn't look back. I abandoned him when he was suffocating from his own despair. I ran away. Are you okay? I sent this message after much hesitation. The memory of that day had been weighing me down more and more heavily each day. Jimin's message was still posted in the chat. Where are you, Hobie? I sent Yoongi a message in another chat with just the two of us. His reply came at dawn. I woke up, startled by the vibration of my phone. Yoongi's name appeared on the screen. He sent me a music file. I put in my earphones and played the file. I listened to his music with my eyes closed, lying on the bed. It was beautiful and unlike anything he'd ever made. Joy and despair intersected amidst sorrow, and a blue sea stirred beyond a desert. Flowers bloomed and withered, and notes leapt and fell headlong the next minute. It resembled Yungi. I asked what the title was, but he responded with another question. When are you coming back? The train station at midday was quiet. People carrying large suitcases were coming down onto the platform to take the oncoming train. They reminded me of myself on the day I'd left. I was wearing what I'd worn that day and carrying the bag of the same weight. But my ankle must have healed. It wasn't the only thing that had healed. I opened our group chat on my phone and posted a message. What's up, my friends? I'm back. How have you all been? Hobie, 13 August, year 22. I dropped by the Just Dance practice room for the first time in a while. I was met with the pounding sound of music, the air filled with the smell of sweat, and the room full of adrenaline. My heart flustered every time I came here. After a round of loud, noisy greetings from the members, I sat against the wall and watched them practice. When would I be able to dance again? I was both impatient and thrilled. I thought of the man's dance. Would I be able to dance like him someday? At that moment, someone came close and sat down next to me. It was that girl. She tapped me on my shoulder, smiling, and said, Where have you been? Were you having fun all by yourself? The two of us in the mirror were sitting side by side, leaning against the wall. How have you been? 
She made an expression that seemed to reproach me for such a rhetorical question. I continued, gazing at myself in the mirror. Have I told you about my mom? I must have repeated it a hundred times. But she always listened to my story enthusiastically. She must be living happily somewhere, right? Then I'm okay. Even if we never meet again, it'd be okay if we're both happy. And she stared at me. And I thought you looked like my mom, but you didn't. I've been busy finding this out. She looked confused. I chuckled and continued to speak. So when do you depart? No, that's not what I was going to say. Congratulations. It was your dream. She bent her head and raised it again. Sorry, I should have told you first. If you're sorry, buy me a meal. I'll throw you a really nice farewell party later. I deliberately smiled a big smile and made a fuss. Let's meet again someday as famous dancers. Work hard, because I'm not going to let you outdo me. And she nodded. The two of us in the mirror sat next to each other, leaning against the wall. So we're at page 218 right now, okay? We're going to keep going. We've only got about 11 pages left. But when I'm done, you need to remind me to go back to the scene on page 207, the man on stage dancing. We need to revisit that. Please do not let me forget. Hopefully you're still enjoying. 207. Write it down. Thank you, Julie. Jin, 15 August, year 22. I saw her for the first time by the railroad. It was about a month ago on a day I had a lot on my mind. I went to see Jungkook at the hospital, but stayed there for only about 10 minutes. I rarely even talked with Jungkook when I was there. For some reason, Jungkook was tense and kept his guard up against me. No message was posted on the group chat. Hobie's message, which said he wouldn't keep in touch anymore, was the last one. I felt like that message was aimed at Yoongi, but whenever I read it, it seemed like it was directed at me for some reason. I left the hospital and walked on blindly. I realized after some time that I was in front of the railroad crossings. The crossing bar was down, and I could see a train approaching in the distance. It reminded me of the time when I got on an airplane alone in my childhood. It might sound silly, but it felt similar. What was I expecting? Whatever it was, was I not supposed to expect something like that? Was that sense of belonging no more than an illusion? What was this emptiness? Was I all alone after all? What did I do wrong? This train of thought continued with the strong wind stirred up by the actual train that passed by. The train disappeared from sight as fast as it had approached. The bar went up and the crossing as open again. She walked towards me, swimming against the flow of air brought by the train. She dropped her diary as she slid by me. In her diary was her wish list, taking an Italian class joining a temple stay program, volunteering at an animal shelter, taking a barista course, and sharing earphones with her boyfriend while taking a walk. Smeraldo was one of them. Underneath a magazine clipping of Smeraldo was the following paragraph. Love is not primarily a relationship to a specific person. It is an attitude which determines the relatedness of a person to the world as a whole. If I truly love one person, I love all persons. I love the world. I love life. If I can say to someone else, I love you, I must be able to say, I love in you, everybody. I love through you, the world. I love in you, also myself. 
from The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. I did a lot of things with her for one month. We took walks, sharing earphones and listening to music like she wanted, and volunteered together in an animal shelter. We couldn't do a temple stay, but we took a bus and traveled to the last stop and spent time at our favorite cafe. Smeralda was a flower that is said to only grow in the northern part of Italy. I dropped by a large flower shop nearby, but no one had ever even heard of the flower. Then I found this small flower shop still under construction. It was at a corner on the left side of after crossing the bridge to Munion. I didn't have high expectations when the owner, who had been organizing some documents in one corner, approached me. Upon hearing the flower name, the owner stared at me for a long time and told me he would be able to deliver the flower, although his shop was not officially open yet. Why does it have to be that flower, he said. She didn't know that I had her diary. She'd never be able to imagine that I'd follow the list in her diary for all the things we'd done together over the past month. Chin. Sorry. I didn't return her diary or tell her that I had it. I knew it was wrong. I knew I was almost deceiving her. Almost. I tried to come clean a few times, but I was afraid. I was afraid she might leave me, just like my friends. I was afraid her heart would turn cold once she got the glimpse of my mistakes, wrongdoings, foolishness, and fear. I wanted to make her happy. I wanted to make her laugh. Every time I made her happy, it felt as if I became a better person. It felt as if my shortcomings were being put out of sight. I had just one more thing to prepare. It was a flower that meant the truth untold in the language of flowers. The owner seemed baffled at my request to get a hold of the Smeralda flower by August 30th and said it'd be difficult to find one by then, but it had to be that day. A display of fireworks was scheduled to take place at Yangcheon Stream. She was fond of the night sky. I was thinking of confessing my love for her when the fireworks burst into the night sky. I was thinking of presenting her with her favorite flower and confiding my heart at her favorite time in her favorite place. Tay, 29 August, year 22. It was Hobie's idea to get together to see the fireworks. After his return, our group chat started buzzing and humming again. We told him how we missed him in a reproachful and welcoming manner, and Hobie responded playfully that we should have realized the importance of his existence earlier. Make sure to come for the fireworks, we all said yes. Junie would arrive after his shift for his part-time job, and Jin also promised to come, however late, after his appointment. I was reminded of my dream when I saw the message. A woman getting killed in an accident with Jin watching her. That dream ended with fireworks. White petals of flames poured down from the night sky. I shook my head to dismiss these thoughts. The venue of our gathering was Junie's container. I sometimes took a walk in its direction when I couldn't sleep at night or when Dad got drunk and acted up. I didn't walk up to the door or stay for long like I used to. I would just turn around when I passed the train station to catch a glimpse of it. But the container was lit every time. I hadn't realized how unusual that was until recently. It was always lit, even when he must have been asleep. I realized that it was a signal for us to come any time. I had no way to know. It was just an assumption. But I was confident. Still, I couldn't knock on the door and go right in because I didn't know what to say. The fireworks are tomorrow. I'll be able to make it on time if I leave as soon as I finish my shift. Yungi, 30 August, year 22. I got off from the bus and strolled along the railroad. Containers emerged from the distance. I saw a Tay from the bus window on my way here. He was also walking towards the direction of the containers. The others must be coming too. 
I completed the piece several days ago. I changed the version I sent to Hobie a few more times. I gave it the title, Hope. To be honest, the title didn't actually match the piece. It contained my fear, cowardice, and inferiority. It contained all the moments I tried to avoid, get away from, and reprimanded myself for. But I couldn't think of any other word that could encompass it all. Junie's container appeared. Someone was standing out in front. His face wasn't visible, but based on his physique, it was Jimin. I stopped and looked around when someone called me from behind. That someone was waving at me in front of the first container. Jin, 30 August, year 22. I received the bouquet of Smeraldo flowers at the last minute. It was, the pa it was past the appointed time and I was looking at my watch impatiently. Fortunately, the delivery truck appeared before she did. The flower shop owner was driving a truck with the Flower Smeraldo logo on the side. Sorry, the fireworks festival held me up. After the truck left, I discovered that there was no card in the bouquet, which I'd ordered with the flowers. And I called the owner right away. Ah, uh, I'll make a U-turn now. The light just changed. Before the owner finished his sentence, she came into view, walking towards me from an intersection far in the distance. Jungkook, 30 August, year 22. I arrived at the railroad really early. The air had cooled down after the sunset, and it was dark. I thought of going into the container, but decided to sit on one corner of the platform across the railroad. It had been a while since we all met. A mixed feeling outweighed joy and expectation. I was constantly reminded of the day of the accident. Jimin was the first to arrive at the container. He opened the door, checked inside, but didn't go in. I jumped off the platform and crossed the railroad again. Yoongi appeared at that moment, walking slowly with his eyes fixed to the ground, and looked back. There was Hobie behind him, loaded down with bags in both hands. I felt uneasy and agitated. I was excited to meet them, but I couldn't just enjoy this moment freely. I'd been waiting for so long for this moment, but wanted to turn around at the same time. The first set of fireworks burst into the air without warning. The white flames surged into the middle of the night sky and exploded into millions of sparkling, blazing petals with a big popping sound. Jin, 30 August, year 22. The delivery truck came to a sudden stop after making a U-turn. Its headlights flashed. I stood there helplessly amidst the scene of crashing, bouncing, and falling. I couldn't hear or feel anything for a moment. It was the summer, but the wind felt chilly. And then I heard something hitting and rolling on the road. The fragrance of flowers tickled my nose. I came back to reality. The bouquet of Smeraldo flowers fell from my hand. She was lying in the middle of the road. Blood began to spread out from underneath her tousled hair. Dark red blood flowed down the road. With a loud pop, the first set of fireworks burst into the air on the night sky in the distance. And somewhere, I heard a mirror crack. Epilogue. Nightmare. Tay. 11 April, year 22. It was dawn when I awoke. Dad's familiar smell and snore streamed from his room. Murky air on the other side of the piece of translucent glass inserted into the front door ruffled. It took only three steps from the narrow entrance where shoes were scattered all over the master bedroom. I'd begun to sleep there since I don't know when. I felt a pressure on my back and shoulders as I picked myself up. I stepped outside of the glass of water in my hand. I carelessly slipped into any shoes and walked slowly. I passed the police station, alley, pedestrian overpass, and the railroad beyond came into sight. 
It was before the sunrise and the street was immersed in silence with no cars out yet. Someone's vomit from earlier in the night reeked. I walked along the railroad. One, two, three, four. I stepped in front of the fourth container from the end. It was Junie's. I reached out for the doorknob and came to a halt. Junie must be asleep now. And what I saw last night in my dream must be nothing more than a nightmare. I took a sip of water and turned around. The dilapidated station and railroad, abandoned houses and trees, and weeds that were growing haphazardly in between. A black plastic bag rolled towards me and then flew into the air. It was a very poor neighborhood. In my dream, this area was enveloped in flames. The entire scene seemed to shimmer and wave. Maybe it was because of the heat, or maybe it was because I was dreaming. Someone's scream, some kind of a crashing sound, the sound of crying, and the sound of something crumbling all came together and flooded my mind. The images that shimmered in the far distance suddenly drew near at full speed. I felt nauseous and shut my eyes, but it was a dream. I couldn't get rid of them by shutting my eyes. My gaze, first blocked by flames, pushed through people standing with their backs to me the next minute, and then stopped suddenly. One, two, three, four. The fourth container was Junie's. The door had fallen off. There were blood stains. Flames surged inside. People stepped aside one after another, and the floor came into view. Junie was lying there. Someone blurted out, He's dead! I opened my eyes to find the ceiling of my house. I could hear Dad snore. It was all a dream. My palm hurt suddenly. I turned up on the cold tap water and held out my palm. It felt numb under the jet of water. I filled a cup with water and drank it. It was a dream. A nightmare. And that ends The Notes, Book One. Two oh seven, thank you. Wow, can I just say wow for a second? Jeez. Now, as I said last night, and I know some of you were here for it, um, we're going to move through book two. We're going to do book two, um, and then we're going to do the webtoon, and then we're going to go through all of the videos again, back to back on a live stream, and see what connects. Um, so we still have work to do, if you're here for it. Um, but there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of tying to be done, right? Um, and just as a heads up, so we still have three more episodes of the BU journey on the next three Mondays. Okay. So that's coming. Not, let's see, not this upcoming week, but the following week I have my hell week at work. Okay, so I'm not going to start book two until after that following week, I think is whatever. So three weeks from now, we'll start book two and we'll probably knock that out in a week anyway. Um, I just don't want to start it next week and then have to stop halfway through because I'm off for a week. I don't want to I don't want to do that. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do now. I have to just share something with you and because you know me well enough you're going to know that I don't want you to necessarily confirm or deny everything that I'm about to throw at you. I just want to kind of think out loud and just so you can kind of hear what's in my brain. Okay, that's really all I'm doing. So there were a few things that jumped out at me 
like the crack of the mirror after she died in the road. Okay, for Jen. Um, the the flowers, of course. Like I get all that. Um, but but there was something significant about this scene with the main dancer on stage. Okay. Because admittedly, I was I was getting a little annoyed at this part. I was getting annoyed at why we're we're following Hobie, okay, and he's talking about leaving Songju and he's got this injury, and then all of a sudden we take this this ridiculously detailed detour to this auditorium where just all of a sudden the, the whole story just stops and we're in this auditorium. I don't know why. And I'm watching this cat dance. Okay. And he's a good dancer. He's got some moves. I don't know why we're here. So I was a little annoyed at that part. And in my head, I'm going, get to the point, get to the point. But of course it started to kind of, I'm going to, I'm not going to say make sense, but it started to feel important. And there were a couple reasons of why I started to think that. Okay. Okay. Let me see here. Let me find the part 207. Okay. First of all, Choreography. He went to the center of the stage. The stage was immersed in silence for a while. Okay. Now also, because again, you also have a few episodes. I'm trying not to spoil too much for you on the BU side of things. Um, but you'll get some pieces as you go. It is what it is. Um, from the time aspect... The... The symbolism of the, the man dancing going to the center of the stage and it was silent for a while. I feel like this is symbolic of time. There's, there's, there's some kind of connection to time here. Like the stage was immersed in silence for a while. There's a stillness to it. To me, that feels representative of time. But then when he said... The music started again, which means that it was completely silent. I'm guessing it's kind of dark, right? The music starts again. This time, the music came down in torrents. The man quickened and slackened his moves to the music. His arms and legs formed not just straight lines and curves, but three-dimensional shapes. Now, this... Ooh. When you think of time, you generally think of time as a straight line. And you can even say curves when you talk about like the trajectory of events. I think that makes sense. Now, if you want to go into like full quantum physics string theory, maybe that's a bit too deep. Okay. With multiple, like, you know, there's the fourth dimension. There's the fifth, like actual physics, you know, quantum physics string theory. But they go so far as to say, they set the stage with the silence and then his movements being straight lines and curves. But then the next layer of that three dimensional shapes, this to me takes the concept of time. It establishes the framework of here's time. Here are multiple events or things that can be connected within events, as in people, as in pairs. You with me so far? And then we take that framework and we kind of turn it so that it's three-dimensional. And then based on my theories, Jin has the ability, now I know this is Hobie's scene, but Jin, I feel like Jin is kind of represented by this guy dancing on the stage because Jin has the ability somehow to take this time and kind of turn it and do something with it. Um, and then another piece that kind of 
drove that, drove me in that direction was the, his movements were creating a story that seemed to have no end, right? Time has no end, but Jin is kind of working this story in a way. And then it says he pushed aside the air with his hands and sent reverberations through the ground, which sent adrenaline rushing not to my eyes, but to my mind. Again, if I think of all the scenes with Jin, he has this power, this ability, and, it, and they talked about it in the beginning of the book. Jin specifically said, I don't know when I started doing this or how I acquired this or whatever it was, but... And then talking about the final moments, like he can't control or change the final moments, but only they can. I'm starting to ramble. Um, but there's something here with this scene with the guy on stage. Him having this power of pushing the side of the air with his hands, sending the reverberations through the ground. His suffering hope, joy, and fear were conveyed unfiltered. We see this pattern of emotions play out multiple times across multiple scenes with multiple characters. The suffering, the hope, the joy, and the fear. So all that to say that I thought this was really, really important because it, it really drove the point home for me of there are so many things tied together and represented on a symbolic or metaphorical way that I think from my standpoint and the way that I like to interpret this stuff, um, I just wonder if there are more references or... Easter eggs, if you will, that are there. Maybe people have not considered. Let's see. Um, I need to add film out to the list of videos. Yes, I have that on the list as well. Correct. Yep, got it. Gamut of human emotions. Yes. All right. Oh, and another thing. There was um, there was a part with the director, the dancer. I was calling the director. There was a part with the director when they were talking about him when he was dancing, and they said he had an injury and he would never dance on stage again. Well, of course, my first reference went back to Black Swan. Now, right or wrong, it wasn't just Black Swan. It was, it was more specifically the alternative version of Black Swan where they start off with the Martha Graham quote. Now, before you freak out and start screaming that Black Swan isn't BU, I know that. However, I still think there's something to be said for the ways that these guys will tie in these concepts in a really, really brilliant and beautiful way. And I don't think we can necessarily completely discount other pieces of art that they have created because it hasn't been labeled BU, if that makes sense, right? Um, so I don't know, it just, it stuck out in my head and I thought that was kind of something. Now, I don't know where the line is for that. You know, in other words, you know, because Yugi's always playing with fire and setting things on fire, does that mean that fire is, is, is attached to it in some way? No, not necessarily. But, you know, the, um, yeah, you know, the, the two times that, the, the, what is it, the two times that we die, we face death for a dancer? I mean, I can't remember the quote, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, 
Yeah. So what did you think? As far as book one goes, um, I'm sure there are some of you here. This is the first time that you have you have heard this story. You've experienced this story in some way. What did you think? Not from a my reading standpoint, but as the story itself, it's, whew, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. Heart wrenching is absolutely right. Interesting. First time here in the notes, second time, nice. You have shed tears. That is a good story. That is well put together story. But thanks, Andrea. A roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see, um, I will be really curious to see what book two looks like, and at the same time, once we finish with book two, we go through the webtoon, which I don't think is going to take us long. Like, there's 15 episodes, but it doesn't look like they're like this. It's a webtoon. We kind of scroll through. It's kind of laid out for us. I don't think that's going to be a big deal. But then to go into maybe uh, Demian, if we read Demian by Herman Hesse, that is also kind of on the table. And like I said, at some point, we're going to take all of the BU videos, put them in order, and go through them directly on one live stream and see the pieces that we can tie together. How annoying is the lack of names for side characters for me? <laughs> um, I actually, uh, it's, Rondo, that's kind of one of the least of my issues, to be honest. Like, you know, uh, that doctor, that girl, or, you know, the owner of the restaurant, like, that, that's fine to me. Um, the hardest part of this, honestly, is that because it's a translation, translation, it doesn't flow well. The way that they write the dialogue does not flow well. So to read it out loud is really, really tricky. You know, it's just, and I know that's just a symptom of the fact that it's a translation. I, I totally get that. Um, but it still makes it really difficult. You know, it's, it's very choppy. They repeat names like over and over and over again. Um, so that really just kind of makes it tricky. And it's really mentally kind of taxing to go through that. I can't tell you how many words I completely butchered that weren't even Korean names. They were just regular words that got tied into other words. And I was just, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But I am enjoying it. And I think this is a, a really, really, really good challenge. I mean, I feel like we warmed up pretty good with girl talk. Um, and now here we are. Now we, we have a book club. Yep. So, well, thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Thelma, Ruth. I appreciate it, you guys, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. I know a lot of you are trying not to fall asleep while we do this, <laughs> but that's okay. You can always watch the replay. If it makes you sleepy, then that's all right, too. I am going to, um, I did ask on Twitter and I think also on Discord through the Twitter post, I asked if you had ideas on uh, what other books to read. And so far, uh, Demian came up. We had um, Junie's entire reading list. Like I, I have Almond. I have, um, I have a few books from Junie's reading list that people sent me early on in mail time. Actually, I think it was one person. Um, so we have that and we also have other, you know, easy stuff that doesn't necessarily have to be a full sit down multiple nights. It could be something easy that we just kind of have fun with. And, and that's the thing I wanted to also tell you real quick before I go is 
I've been hesitant to kind of stop and really give my thoughts along the way, not just because of, you know, the fact that we still have three episodes of the BU dropping on, on Mondays, and I want you guys to also kind of enjoy that fresh, but because I know there will be a lot of people who watch this after the live stream that may or may not have the type of... Um, I, for lack of a better term, I'll say social connection that we have here. They might not get some of my jokes or, you know, our inside jokes or references. And I wanted to make it as clean as possible for people that might get to enjoy this outside of our community. So I wanted to keep it as clean as I could. And I'm going to do the same thing with book two. I just want to keep it clean and go from there. And then at the end or as, as minimal as possible, I'll give you my occasional thoughts and uh, and then that way even more people can enjoy it. So, and that's another reason why, you know, when we choose other books, you know, we can choose some fun stuff too. I actually kind of like the idea of us sometime trying like a little choose your own adventure where you get to kind of choose along the way as the chat, you get to make the choices. I think that would be fun. And then God only knows what kind of nonsense you're going to drive us into. But, uh, you know, we're here for it. I think that would be fun. Good. I'm glad you're all having fun. And, uh, man, I can't believe we finished the first book already. That's awesome. I hope you enjoyed. And as soon as I know, um, as of right now, tomorrow's live stream will start at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is of, as of right now. If that changes, I will post an event on Discord. I will tweet about it. I will let everybody know. And then worse comes to worse, you get a, you get a, a, uh, a notification saying, here we go, it's go time, and it's time for chaos. All right? Until then, I will see you. And don't forget, I'm Roscoe. I'm your ASMR buddy. Look out for each other. We still have so many books so many books and boops ahead of us.